Church, United Church of Christ, Milford, New Hampshire. It is the sixth Sunday of Easter, May 17th, 2020. A few announcements. Um, if you ha have a high school senior in your family who's graduating this year, we'd love to have you send me, email me a photograph of them, or several photographs, including some of the things they like to do besides their graduation picture. Um, send them to me um, at my email address, and we're going to put together a video honoring them for the June 7th worship service. If you are interested in coming and reading the call to worship and the responsive reading on any given week, um, get in touch with me, let me know, and we will arrange for it. Um, the way it would work is you come here on a Thursday around noontime, and we record right here in the, ha the Haskell Chapel. And then we can edit that all in and get it ready to go so it'll be ready for worship on Sunday. In the next few weeks, I'm going to ask some of our high school seniors if they'll read for us. So you'll get a chance to see them. Um, I'm very sorry to have to announce that Nancy Schooley's grandson, Aaron, lost his battle with addiction on Wednesday. As of now, there are no funeral services planned. Um, if there are any, uh, I'm sure we will let you know. Please keep Nancy in your prayers. 
Liz Bruce also got some disheartening news that uh, Dave is going to be in uh, Dave is going to be in rehabilitation for a much longer time than they thought, and so Liz could use our prayers as well. Please join me in the call to worship. God calls us to follow Christ and keep the commandments. Christ promises another comforter who will be with us forever. Those who keep the commandments are those who love Christ. Help us to keep the commandments and rejoice in the Advocate. Jesus promises to reveal himself to those who love him. Come, precious Jesus, come. Let us worship God together. Say to God, how terrible are thy deeds! So great is thy power that thy enemies cringe before thee. All the earth worships thee. They sing praises to thee, sing praises to thy name. Come and see what God has done. He is terrible in his deeds among men. He turned the sea into dry land. Men passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip? Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried aloud to him, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. That thy way may be known upon earth and thy saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise thee, O God. Let all the peoples praise thee. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou dost judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. The earth has yielded its increase, God. Our God has blessed us. God has blessed us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Here ends today's responsive reading. So I'm going to talk to the children now. So 
I know all of you guys go to some kind of school, and today we're going to be talking with the adults about some rules. Right? So a lot of us don't like rules. I know that when you go to school, there are rules at school. Things like don't talk when the teacher's talking, or we have quiet time now, so it's time to not talk and to do on other things. And some of us, the hardest part for us is to learn the rules. And Jesus, in the, in the part I'm going to read in a little while, is talking about his rules and what he thinks the rules should be. And the rules are very simple. Love God and love each other. And that's really the simplest rule there is. You can't break the rules if you love everybody. You can't not like someone if you're trying to love them. So really, when we're talking today during the worship, we're going to be talking about what it means to love one another. So I hope that you'll listen, and I hope that you'll get something out of it. But it's like school. It's just the rules that we have for how to live as Christians. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you so much for the simple rules that you've given us. Help us to obey those rules, and to live those rules every day, in every way. In Jesus' holy name, Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Here ends the reading from God's Holy Word. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Rock and our Redeemer. 
So today's reading is really special to me. It's the basis for one of my favorite choral anthems, one that I've sung many, many times. I really love it when our readings connect with pieces of music that I have performed. It makes the entire message and the anthem that it conveys just that more meaningful. Vern and I have performed If You Love Me by Thomas Tallis many times, both in our church choirs and with the small magical group that we used to sing with. At the end of today's sermon, you're actually going to listen to Plymouth's Church of the Pilgrimage singing this very piece. Vern and I traveled one very hot summer day in 2018 to Plymouth, where we, where we sang this, among others, that we put on an album when it was 105 degrees in the sanctuary. I hope that you will enjoy it, and I hope you'll get as much out of it as I do, I do singing it. John's message today was written for people surrounded by agents of the Roman Emperor. Images of imposed Roman domination, they were everywhere. They were on buildings, on signs, on posters. The Roman legions carried them on sticks as they were marching around, even on the money. And of course, everywhere they looked were soldiers, force of arms to enforce that domination. It's almost impossible to imagine a starker contrast to Jesus' message of love. There's so much richness and beauty in this message. John's Gospel offers drastically different claims about the power and order that love brings to relationships. Jesus is preaching a life shaped by love, but he's also acknowledging that choosing to see reality through the lens of love is not some abstract idea, but it's in the midst of an empire. It is difficult. This love Jesus is talking about isn't some abstract idea. Jesus, it's a lived reality that Jesus himself is modeling. Touching and caring, loving, healing. <clears throat> He's demonstrating a life of service and compassion. It's also a fierce protest against the powers that be. The powers that view individuals only as valuable as their contributions to that power. The power that abuses and discards anyone and anything that dares to challenge the status quo. The people that Jesus calls by name were likely hoping to be invisible to that power so that they and their families would stay safe. In that time, being noticed by the oppressor usually didn't turn out well for those they turned their eyes on. Jesus, in contrast, invites those who meet him to imagine power that has, a goal, has its, as its goal the well-being of all persons, regardless of their position or social status. Jesus offers the amazing suggestion that God loves them, and, is, and us, simply for who we are. That love in the end is far more powerful, more real than any government. Because the love that Jesus offers is God's love. The love God calls us to doesn't need any hierarchy. The reality of God's love shows us the truth that God calls upon us to be neighbors to recognize the other whom God also loves equally and to, for us to love them as well without qualification or reservation. Jesus tells us that God's love is true. God's love is not just the source of all life, that love, love is also the goal of life. Jesus in John's narrative talks about being in the Father and in us. But the word he uses can also mean among us. That simple distinction between in and among makes it a very personal experience. How to affect our ability to receive Jesus' promises 
if we put less emphasis on the individualized interpretation and more emphasis on the communal and, and communal idea of an active life of service together. When the Pharisees tried to trip Jesus up by asking him what was the greatest commandment, he answered to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus wisely linked the two as being absolutely inseparable. Just as a healthy spiritual life involves a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it must also be connected to a relationship and service with other believers as an outward expression of our faith. In reading this today, I was reminded of what love really looks like. Back in 2013, while I was at Andover Newton, there was a guest program put on by Friends of Roots, a Middle Eastern organization that attempts to solve the Middle Eastern crisis through negotiation and discussion and understanding. There was a rabbi in Israel who had been an extreme anti-Muslim to the point of organizing hit squads and encouraging the assassination of Palestinian imams. He had ordered the assassination of a particular imam, a well-known Palestinian cleric, who also regularly called for and encouraged his followers to kill Israelis. There were several unsuccessful attempts on the imam's life, and he in turn ordered the execution of the rabbi who ordered his. That attempt, attempt severely wounded the rabbi, but he did recover. At some point, the two of them, as leaders of a violent section, were, were brought to the negotiation table to see if they could resolve some of that problem. They were brought together by someone who recognized that there can never be any kind of peace as long as people are trying to kill each other and encouraging their followers to kill each other. And after much argument, they gradually realized, after much discussion, that they were both putting their followers in more danger. Over a period of time, they began to realize that their goals were almost exactly the same. They just wanted a safe place where they could live their lives, where their followers could lead normal, healthy, safe lives, and stop the violence and begin to travel around the region. And they did. They began to travel around the region around Palestine and Israel, and they began coming to going to Europe, and I saw them when they were at Andover Newton in Newton, Massachusetts. They are now two parts of the Friends of Roots program. The Friends of Roots Institute that's working across lines to try and heal the divisions and bring peace to that troubled area. I remember when listening to these two widely different men speak, the sense of purpose and dedication that they each showed to their individual faiths and to the, the, two, the dedication that these two former enemies had working together for peace. That's really one of the best examples I can see of keeping Jesus' commandments. While neither one of them was a Christian, they were living the love thy neighbor. While we may not be working on such monumental tasks as the Israeli-Palestine conflict, we're still charged by our faith, by our God, to do everything we can to build bridges between our wildly different attitudes towards how we are to live and thrive in this day and age. Loving God is easy. Loving our neighbor, not always so much. It's especially hard to love our neighbor when we don't even like them. There are many of us for whom we have had a very hard time accepting that God loves them too. Because we know that they aren't worthy of God's love. <clears throat> and in this politically volatile time, it's, re it's really easy to let that anger and that vitriol take us over. We need to put away the anger, to put down the accusations. We need to listen, 
really listen to people we don't agree with. Not with a view towards pointing out how wrong they are, not with a view of changing their minds, but rather to begin to find things that we have in common and begin to calm down the anger. As Yoda said, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to the dark side of the Force. You cannot hate someone you love. You can disagree, you can be disappointed in them, but love never leads to hate. And right now, in this time of stress, uncertainty, and division, we all need all the love we can muster. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. Can I get an amen?
Keep bringing us back to your center, returning us to your fold, welcoming us at your table, even when we don't believe we deserve it. Help us to welcome others to that table, even when we don't think they deserve it. Help us to know that it is through you that we live and move and have our being. Help us to keep our thoughts and actions focused on your commandments that we love you and that we love each other without qualification or exception. Help us to realize that it is only through our efforts to obey you do we live with full humanity and freedom. Hear us as we pray for those enduring suffering and pain, that they may find healing and comfort. Comfort those dealing with the loss of loved ones. Help them know that even in our absence we suffer with them. Guide our leaders to put the needs of all people ahead of selfish partisan interests. Guide our teachers as they struggle with new ways of teaching and learning that are meaningful for their students. And guide our students that they may find meaning and comfort in the efforts of their teachers. In all this, Lord, we ask your forgiveness we ask your grace, and above all, we ask for your love. In the name of the ultimate gift of love, Jesus the Christ. Amen. face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace.